Hello. Welcome once again to Speakeasy with Paul F. Tompkins. I am still Paul F. Tompkins, and my guest this time is an author, an actor, a comedian? Please say hello to Mr. John Hodgman. John. Hello. Hello, hello to you. Cheers. Well deployed. Thank you for being here. Question mark on comedian. I appreciate that. Well, because I, it, it sets up an anticipation in the audience's mind. Sure. How badly will he fail? Now, what are you about to set on fire? <laughs> Because this is a new thing that guests don't usually do here. I am going to garnish my martini. Oh! Very exciting. Now what happened just there? Tell me about the science. I learned from Dale DeGroff, master bartender, and formerly my client when I was a literary agent. Is that so? To, to, to flame uh, fresh fruit peels over the drink, because there are flammable oils in there. But if you put the match in front of it, and then you just squeeze it with, this, with the, the peel side out, those oils will express and light on fire and sort of sprinkle over the drink. Take a sip of your martini. Sure. And now, I haven't, I haven't had anything to drink from this. Take a sip from that one and, and tell me if there's any difference. I'm sure there won't be. Not really, right? No. Mm -hmm. Except for your poisoning. Good night, everyone. Welcome to Speakeasy with John Hodgman. So you get to New York City from Brookline, Massachusetts? No, well, I am from Yale University. Ooh, okay. Uh, yes, I am from Brookline, Massachusetts. That's right. Uh, as I have said to you many times. Mm -hmm. And then I went to Yale University, which I've said to you twice as many times. But you, with me, you just said Yale. You didn't do that thing where people say, like, oh, I went to school, uh, not Harvard. Right. If I said I went to school in New Haven, Connecticut, everyone would go, <laughs> oh, Albertus Magnus. Or nothing. They would might say nothing. Oh, was that, I thought, was that a curse word? Albertus Magnus? Yeah. Is yeah. that a Harry Potter curse word? <laughs> oh, Paul. How did you end up being a goddamn literary agent? So, in college, I studied literary theory, because literature itself was too practical. It somehow was lost on me that my parents had spent a lot of money to educate me. I just mm. thought I had it all coming to me. Right. And so I moved to New York having really just spent four years reading books and watching movies and working at the video store and having cocktails and, and, and swanning around. Mm -hmm. And it turns out the world did not give a feces about mm -hmm. me. So I, I knew that I had two trades. I knew I had to Cowboy read- Cowboy gigolo. <laughs> All right, three, you're right, mm -hmm. I apologize. I, but I didn't really go into that then because they were cleaning up Times Square and it just wasn't the same. Yeah. One, uh, I knew how to read uh, short stories and imitate write short stories. Mm -hmm. You're talking about writing fiction? Yeah, that's what I thought I was going to do. I was going to mm -hmm. come to New York and write short stories about people with feelings, serious literature, mm -hmm. but only short because I knew that I could never write a novel. You just, in your mind, it was absolutely not a thing. Yeah, I'm a narcissist, but I'm not that kind of narcissist. Like, I think I can probably convince uh, all the other dummies in the world, those faceless mannequins that make mouth noises at me, to spend time with me for about 20 pages. Mm -hmm. but, the, but beyond that, even I begin to have doubts mm -hmm. about, about my compelling nature. Whereas a true novelist never has those doubts. That is, that is a true sociopath. And then I had another trade, which was I could mong cheese. I had been a cheesemonger briefly during my Drink Abroad program in London. Mm -hmm. And so I had some cheese expertise. Cheese and, expertise, if you will. Yeah, cheese expertise. And uh, and I, I knew that I knew that like I used to believe that Stilton was chump cheese, but now I really believe in it. Because I was a youth, I thought there were more exciting blues. But you, truly, Stilton is one of the best. Will you answer this right now on the record? Sure. What turned you around on Stilton? I look. There was a there was blue Dauvergne. There was a Cashel blue, an Irish blue, know, which yes. is gorgeous. Everyone knows this. Well, not everyone did in the early '90s, sir. Can you imagine such a time of ignorance? <laughs> I did my best to uh, educate the masses. I thought the important thing was to to pick out the fanciest, weirdest things you could, mm -hmm. whether it be a writer, a cheese, a, 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 a jacket, a lifestyle, an affectation. I was full of all kinds of affectations, mm -hmm. and obviously, I still am. Look at my mustache. But I've, I've later come to realize that sometimes the simplest thing is the best. And, and Stilton is, a, is not simple at all. It's complex, it's magnificent. It's just, it is your dad's blue cheese. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> I do. And there's no point in trying to make blue cheese sexy. It is what it is. Hey, you can put lipstick on a pig. Why did you do that? To torture a pig.
pigs had it coming. To scare, to scare a pig. It's as smart as a dog, and I've it's terrified yeah. that you're going to kill it now. I've read Animal Farm. Sure. So I applied for a job. As a cheesemonger? As a cheesemonger. Across Third Avenue, there was a cheese store, and the gentleman said, I will hire you, but you should look for something else. And I said, OK, I will. And so I applied for jobs in publishing, because that was a thing that existed oh, wait, at the time. Why did he say this? Because he knew that I was not, I was not. You weren't uh, cut out for a cheese life. He didn't. Yeah, he was like, you, you just arrived in New York City. Mm -hmm. Everyone can cheese mong. Try a little harder before you come back here and cut the cheese. Now this guy was a veteran of Studio Fifty Four, where yeah, people were just like yeah. openly smearing cheese on yeah. their faces. That guy, that guy had uh, had uh, served uh, poise at Max's Kansas City. Do you know what I mean? Like he was, he had, he had, he had cut brie with Lou Reed, you know? Like he was an old school. He, he had seen so many kids come into the city and try to be cheese stars. And then he had to tell them, you know what? Take a minute, develop trade. Ha develop your plan B. Not everyone can be a superstar cheesemonger and that man's to, name? To, to the Warhol factory. And that man's name was Hilly Crystal. <laughs> So instead, I, uh, I started looking for jobs in, in book publishing because that existed. And it seemed, yes. it seemed like uh, something that was my speed. Mm -hmm. uh, I could be around books, yep. I could be around writers, and I liked those things. You know, but I was lazy, I didn't love to read, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? I found a literary agency that was hiring someone for their front desk. I walked up to the door, I'm like, I'll take the job. It was in a brownstone that had belonged to the Astor family and was held as their private bank. It's where they stored, it's where they stored all their fur money. I mean, not money made of fur, but money they made selling From furs. Fur, yeah. Right, exactly. There may have been some fur dollars in there, I don't know. Sure. You know what I mean? They, they, they traded with Canadians who knew what kind of script they were getting. There was a huge vault in the back and the place was full of leather divans and ferns and shadows, dark shadows where I knew you could push a leather divan and take a nap, and no one would notice and no one would care. But you just push it into the corner of a room? It was a dark, wood-paneled world right. that looked like what publishing as an entity should mm -hmm. be to me. Mm -hmm. And it turned out that it was a real literary agency. It was not a Hollywood set. And they actually, <laughs> they actually represented incredible authors. It was a wonderful place to work. I loved the people that I worked with. I loved the writers that I worked with. And uh, I took some naps. Book publishing is an apprenticeship industry. For example, Paul, uh, let's say you wanted to write a book. I have a book idea. Hi, Hello. I'm John Hodgman. I'll be your agent. How do you do? A pleasure. Great. Can't wait to get rich. Good. I just graduated from college a year ago. Good. I actually have no experience reading or negotiating contracts, but I'll represent you. Do I find this unusual? My saying it would be unusual. Certainly. But even if I said it, you, as a potential author, would be so desperate that you would say, Yes! And we are doing business mm. now. And then I would call up publishers and say, I have a wonderful author named Paul F. Tompkins. Uh, here is his book proposal. I am ready to receive your offers. And then a year later, I would say, Gosh, it hasn't really been coming together. Maybe you could write another book proposal or do some more work or come into New York and meet the book publishers and woo them. Please, I've been eating macaroni and cheese for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I can't advance you any money. Oh, I've developed a ramen intolerance. I'll tell you what, I've had some interest from book editors that I have come to know spending our company's money on lunches and cocktails for each other. They're also 23 years old, and they have no power in their industry. So they're willing to look at your proposal. How does that sound? How do I get in the good graces of these 23-year-olds? Well, do more work for free. Oh, back to the macaroni and cheese mines. I'm, I'm, I, I don't know what I'm doing. Suddenly I realized, oh, I do not have all the time in the world. I should not waste years upon years being unhappy doing something that I know in my heart is not the right thing for me to do because I'm afraid to tell my clients, I'm sorry I have to go and do something else because they might, uh, be angry. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, none of them were angry. They're like, thank you. <laughs> My career has been successive escapes from dying industries. So first I was in book publishing, right. and then I, I pulled the ripcord and got out and started writing for, for print magazines. You remember those? I do. They were hilarious. And I wrote, 
I wrote, like you would write a thing and then it would appear three months later and someone would give a dollar for it and to, to a newsie, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and you go I, buy a big Christmas goose. Mm -hmm, and I wrote about food and non-wine alcohol mm -hmm. for Men's Journal and then I started writing features for the New York Times Magazine. And that was the first half, that was for about five or six years. And then someone said, you should write a book. And I was like, look, I know from experience the worst kind of books are the books that are written so that someone feels good that they have written a book. And I don't want to be someone who wastes everybody's time that way. If I have an idea for a book that I can't not do, I will do it. What about short stories? I published a serious short story in the Paris Review. I uh, did not know that. Yes, and I read, I, I was invited to a, a reading, uh, to give a reading of that story along with other, other authors in that particular issue. And I read it and people were laughing throughout it. But it was not supposed to be funny. It wasn't supposed to be funny, but I knew enough that I realized in the middle of it, oh, this is funny. Like I wasn't offended. Right. So all these French people, they giggle at your story and you're like, I've got it. They're, they're not. <laughs> Even then it took a little while before I, was, I started writing for McSweeney's, Dave Eggers' journal of literature and humor. Mm -hmm. And for their website, I started writing an advice column called Ask a Former Professional Literary Agent, <laughs> where all the people who would write in, like, you know, authors want to know how do you, what kind of book to write. And so I finally gave them the answers I always wanted to give. It's like, first of all, there's only one kind of book to write, vampires fighting serial killers. Mm -hmm. Get on it if you want to make some money. <laughs> the, real, the real question is what style of beret to wear, to the left or to the right? It turns out that a lot of my advice, the beret was just a joke, but that's still true about vampires versus serial killers. Like, the, it, it never ends. Mm -hmm. That uh, vampires and zombies are, are literally the genre tropes that will not die. Mm -hmm. And I started writing this funny column for McSweeney's, and Dave said, this is what you should be doing. And meanwhile, my editor at Men's Journal, Mark Adams, was saying, you, you're trying to write seriously, but you should be funny. And I was like, I thought that was something I was trying to shouldn't be doing. And they both were like, no, not, not everybody can do that and it's a good skill to have. And once I started doing that, I realized that the only kind of book that I could ever possibly do would be one that would capture the same kind of deranged authority mixed with sincerity that was in that Ask a Professional Literary Agent column in the very early, early, early days of the internet when there were no blogs. Right. Finally, someone said to me, do you want to write a book of trivia? And I knew immediately I did. Because mm -hmm. I loved trivia books. I loved The People's Almanac. Mm -hmm. I loved uh, The Book of Lists. Yep. William Poundstone's Big Secrets. It's my favorite book of all. Did you ever read that one, No, Paul? I've never heard of that one. No, I'm going to get that one for you. And I was like, yeah, I want, to, I want to do that. But there are all these books that I love already that exist. Mm -hmm. What new thing can I bring to the world of esoteric fact? Mm -hmm. How about esoteric fact that is secretly esoteric fiction, mm -hmm. where I make up the trivia? So instead of the nine... U.S. presidents who love to smoke cigars or whatever, it's the nine U.S. presidents who had hooks for hands. Right. And FDR had a hook for a hand and nobody knew about it because no one would talk about it because mm -hmm. they would only photograph him from the wrist up, you know. <laughs> so now you write uh, altogether three books of fake trivia. Sure. And, uh, and the world didn't even want one. <laughs> well, I... See what I mean about persistence, they Paul? They didn't know that they wanted one. Somewhere in there, performing enters your life. And now you are getting paid to appear on television. Yeah, well, I mean, it happened all at once at the, uh, the beginning of 2006, the year after my first book came out. I went on The Daily Show as a guest, mm -hmm. and we had a good time, John Stewart and to I. To promote your book. Yeah, to promote yeah. my book. We had a good time, John Stewart and I, talking about the hobos of the Great Depression mm -hmm. and how they briefly took over the United States government. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got a call uh, from The Daily Show not long after that saying, that was fun, would you want to come back and perform comedy on the show? Mm -hmm. And I said, sure, because I figured they were being polite. They must say that to everybody, right? <laughs> Reza Aslan, right? Don't they say that to him? You should be a correspondent now. Yeah. Some weeks later, in January of 2006, Ben Carlin, who had been the EP of the show, said, mm -hmm. could you write you know, 700 words on nuclear proliferation in Iran by Monday? come into the show and if it works, we'll put you on. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what happened to mm -hmm. my utter astonishment. It was truly as close to a through the looking glass experience 
as I could have because it was like I walked on the other side of the glass. Up to this point, had performing even been a thing that was on your mind? Sure, that's the thing, Paul. It had been on my mind, but I had given up. That's right, you dirty little I'm sneak. So, I am a sneak. I knew it! Yeah, I did an end run. <laughs> Why should I pay all of those dues <laughs> that those dopes are doing? I'll take this secret path to television That's by right. working at a literary agency That's for right. seven years and then writing columns about uh, cheese and deep Ruining other people's yeah, careers. Deep fried hamburgers <laughs> and, and barbecue through the American South until finally uh, uh, I, get, I get to go on, on my favorite television show and, and offered a role. Right. I, I planned it all out from the beginning. <laughs> that, to me, I felt was the strangest thing that would ever happen in my life. And then I was asked to audition for this Apple ad, and I said, sure, that'll be a funny story about how I auditioned for this ad and I don't get the job, and I'll tell that story after that ad, you know, someone else gets the job or whatever. That I'll was tell. the story I was able to tell. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no, Paul, it was no. Fine. It was oh, fine. I didn't know that. <laughs> my, everything's fine. It should not have been me. I'll put it that why way. Why would you say that? Well, when they asked me to audition, I said, sure, I'll come in to find out why they're asking me. And then I realized when I went in, oh, they're not asking me. They're, I saw everyone that I knew in the performing world in, in New York, not even knowing that that was also happening in LA mm -hmm. and maybe other cities. But it's people, comedians, performers, actors that I knew and had come to love and respect were also there reading for the same thing. And I realized that this wasn't a story for me to tell. Mm -hmm. um, this wasn't an anecdote in the making. That really, everyone, everyone who is here wants the job. Right. And it is a disservice to them for me to pretend that I'm just here for, for a laugh. Mm -hmm. And so I did a thing that I had kind of in some ways not done before, which was I really tried. I really just decided I'm going to be completely present here mm -hmm. and not be looking at this from any sort of authorial remove to tell a story about it later. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna give it my all. And there was a thing where they asked me to uh, human beatbox. And Jenna Gavelber at Brookline High School had taught me how to human beatbox and hum at the same time. You did, that's right. Jenna Gavelber. Are you saying a name? Yeah, Jenna Gavelber, that's Adam Driver's character in Star Wars. <laughs> I said, we found our PC. No, but there was just a moment where I realized that's not really great, but I may have gotten the job. And that is going to really upset my nap schedule. <laughs> you are doing your own comedy. You yes. A special on Netflix, uh, which people can still see on Netflix, right? It Ragnarok. is. Ragnarok. It is available forever on Netflix. John Hodgman, colon, Ragnarok. Yes, and they can see it on Netflix for a reason that steams me a little bit. Because uh, the reason they can continue to see it is that the world did not end. My special was predicated on the idea That's right. that, it, that the world would end on the night we recorded it, mm -hmm. December 21st, 2012, just like the Mayans told us. That's right. But in fact, it did not end. So when the time came to, that they said to me, do you want to release your special on digital versatile disc in a hard copy, eternal, mm -hmm. I said, I would like to do that, but I would like to surround it with other physical merchandise that you cannot get mm -hmm. uh, online. Right. Based on themes from the special, I produced a physical Apocalypse Armageddon proof DVD mm -hmm. that will not be wiped out in the Omega Pulse. I also included some survival mayonnaise that was had been crafted for me for the show by Empire Mayonnaise Company of Brooklyn. I had uh, included a urine flask so you can store your own urine because that's a handy disinfectant and then I also included, for my own longevity, some actual mustache clippings mm -hmm. so that people would have my DNA so that they from could clone From your mustache? Me. Yeah, from my mustache. And you also get my consciousness mm -hmm. uh, that's been downloaded to a thumb drive, which is me just staring into a camera for an hour. And this is not a loop. This is you for a full hour staring into a camera. It's actually like an hour and 20 minutes. And then, uh, and then I, I commissioned a, a cologne a, a Hodgman branded fragrance, which I, I felt compelled to do. In my special, I had talked a lot about 
how along with goats and rabbits and other livestock that you want to keep in your survival compound, the best kind of animal to keep in your survival compound is sperm whales. That's right. They are companionable animals. They're handy watch pets for vengeful sailors in your neighborhood. Mm -hmm. They're full of spermaceti. And they're full of spermaceti and blubber and, uh, and ambergris, which is traditionally used as a perfume fixative and you want to smell good after the apocalypse because there may not be a lot of running water. So is your dream that someone will say to another person, hey, I love that fragrance, what is it called? Or what are you wearing? And that person will have to say, Sperm by John Hodgman. I'd like them to say it this way. What am I wearing? Sperm. Sperm. By John Hodgman. Now you've been in commercials, have you ever seen one? All right. Be, be busy doing a thing, right? You're just minding your own business. Yeah, play with the matches. Excuse me, I can't help but notice your divine fragrance. What are you wearing? Sperm by John Hodgman. Ooh, I don't know if that was. John. What? Congratulations, you have made all your dreams accidentally come true. A pleasure chatting with you. Thank you. I'll see you at home. But you know what? One of my dreams truly has come true. Which is? To be on Speakeasy with Paul F. Thomas. There it is! Paul, you know how I feel about you. John, you know how I feel about you. I'm learning. <laughs> that does it for this round of Speakeasy with Paul F. Tompkins. Join me again next time when my guest will be a different person. Satisfying and nutritious. Talk about your childhood wishes. You don't say. Very weird nose over there. We have different noses. That's that is, a, that's that a is flat true. wide. Take that into account. I think a little bigger on the eyes. Okay, bigger on the eyes. <laughs>